four residents of uh, Asham and who are in the custody of the military have been handed over to the Tema Police uh, Command for further investigations and further prosecution. In an interview with Joy News, the ranking member of the Defence and Interior Committee of Parliament, James Agaga, indicated that the military high command in a meeting with the committee on Thursday accepted responsibility and also uh, expressed regret over the uh, brutalities on Tuesday. Three acts of the Ghana Armed Forces. Scores of residents are gathered here on the streets of Ashaim and Taifa discussing the assaults by the soldiers. Here, I've met 31 year old unemployed woman Beatrice Bochu. She looks distressed and says she has not heard from her husband since Tuesday when she was taken away by the military in that swoop. I have no idea what was happening. They arrested him on his way to a public toilet in the neighborhood. It has been three days now and I have not heard anything from him. Our child is unwell. He's the breadwinner of the family. He takes care of us financially. It has been difficult getting food to eat. Three days I have not been able to send our child to the hospital. I am begging government to intervene for him to be released. My husband knows nothing about what happened. It is possible Beatrice's husband is part of the 34 Ashaiman residents who have now been handed over to the Tema police for further investigation and possible prosecution. Ashaiman MP Ennis Nogby says the residents were picked on Tuesday and have now been handed over to the police. But by and large, as we sat in the meeting today and they have admitted that there were excesses and they were going to the ground, going to go to the ground and also ascertain the facts, we still have about 34 men with the military, which uh, this afternoon the CDS told me they were sent to the uh, uh, police high command in Tema. And so I'm going to make a follow-up to the, the, the commander, the police commander, the regional commander in Tema to see what uh, uh, the outcome of uh, their screening is, so that if there's a need for us to uh, even uh, uh, require bail for them, uh, we will do that. But uh, as I speak to you, about 34 of them are still in police custody, uh, per the, the briefing of the CDS, that they have sent them to the regional command of the police. You also have marks on your Yeah, I do have let, let, on. Let, me, let me see. Wait, what caused, what caused this? What did they use to beat you? Any weapon they're having on their hands. Others were using rope. Oh, no, 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 no. He still have some bruises behind him, but we can't show that on TV. They were using... These are assault weapons. marks behind you? Yes, sir. What kind of weapons? Others were using nim tree branches and um, cables, pipe, PVC pipes, and all types of things that they are holding. So when were you released? Were you released? on the same day? Yeah, I was released on the same day, around 11 p.m., as my, my colleague friend said. So you're also only in boxer shorts? Yes. No no singlet or no, anything? No dress, no dress. And they dropped you at what? Um, a Sherman runabout. <sighs> this is the exact spot where um, the 21-year-old Sheriff Imoru um, fell residents um, here um, tell me that they discovered the body here early um, in the morning. We told that he had run from a distance of about 300 meters after um, he was stabbed, but couldn't continue with his journey and then fell right here. And this is the point where um, the community people discovered um, the body. Goswe Kumakil is one of the organizers of a press conference calling for um, justice and punishment for the perpetrators of Tuesday's brutality. We were beaten. You will be, you will roll on the floor. You eat like a dog on the floor. We are left. They left us around 10:30 that way. Okay. And they, they took us from official town, but bringing us home, they left us at timber market with only a boxer shirt and no tops. Wait, when you were going, were you wearing a shirt? We are not. We had picked up from official town. 
with no top. Eh? You are not allowed to wear anything. We are not allowed to wear dress. Okay. We are bare chested like the, my gentleman, but with only boxer shorts. From here on to Michel Camp to Bema Camp. In bringing us back, we are left at our timber market, the runabout. Yeah. Naked like that. David Kemi is a former teacher. He has a deep cut on his head, and then he also has some assault marks um, at his back. He says uh, the soldiers who meted out those beatings to them must be made to face the full rigors um, of the law. Somewhere at four o'clock, I opened my gate. When I opened the gate, I saw the ammo car under the shade of the tree, just at the back of the shade of the tree and the one commando here, standing here, like, and then he used the gun on me. So he asked me to come. So I thought he needed an information. But then I was my boxer. I did not wear anything. So when I came, he just asked me to go closer. But then the water was on the ground. So when I was there, before I could rise, about three of you know, his team came around. He started slapping me, and then, they asked me to roll on the ground. Head, but this cut is from the belt. The belt that the, the man lose the belt and they hit it and I, I was trying to parade it. And I had a cut. Ranking member of the Defense and Interior Committee, James Agaga, revealed the military high command in a meeting with the committee on Thursday accepted responsibility and expressed regret for Tuesday's brutalities. In the course of the deliberations, the High Command took responsibility for um, uh, the, the operation, but they went ahead to express some regret at the excesses that uh, you know we all saw uh, in videos that have gone viral. We all condemned the excesses, and so we are looking to visit a chairman as a committee together with the command. Meanwhile, the mother of Sheriff Imura says the death of her son has shattered the dream of a better future for her family. Sakina to Ifia Chira says, um, being the first of two of her children, she was hopeful that her son will grow into the breadwinner for her family. The 21-year-old was murdered by some unknown persons in Ashtayman on Saturday, less than two years after he joined the military. Tears, wailing, and grief composed the atmosphere as friends and families gathered here at the 37th military mosque to observe the final funeral rite of the slain soldier, Sharif Imuro. The 21-year-old Imuro graduated from the army less than two years ago. He was gruesomely murdered in a shaman on Saturday by some unknown persons. Today, he goes home in accordance to Islamic customs. After the funeral service, which lasted for about 20 minutes, Imoro's body was transported to the Burma Camp Military Cemetery for burial. Imoro's uncle, Ahmed Abdul, narrated how the family received the death of their beloved son. We had a call. The mother had a call from the camp, Burma Camp that uh, they invited her to come and they asked her if she's coming she should come with an elderly person then she said oh and the son committed some sin and they said no so later they call back and ask her to remain they will come by themselves so it was there around 10 minutes 20 minutes then she decided to call them again and they said they have not set off when they set off they will let her know so people were holding mobile phone so it was on social media yeah. one of his brothers came with the phone and then was about to tell her what happened and then she snatched the phone from the brother before she saw that the son was in the blood cold blood so there she called back and then the military respond that they are coming but she should come down the child is not dead so we were there about an hour before they came when they came they came and narrated all their story to us then one my brother called ibrahim he asked them so is our our son died then he said yes he's dead then they asked him where is the body then he said the body is at the 37 box that's how we got to know his mother said the death of a son Imoro, has dashed her hope of a better future 
for her family. Sheriff, eh, your boy, for a boy, me. Sheriff, yeah, dear mammy, pa. Bless Sheriff, in your German. Of our phone, friend, me say, ma. Oh, bring you now to a trap, my near Juma, my feminine Nuyano. And so, Mamma Sheriff, I'm here, Nuyano. No, my dear Sheriff, in the clear free and so. Among these mourners are Imoro's schoolmates who described him as a calm person and diligent with everything he did. He was very calm. The only thing he liked was food. He was always present to dining. He was always in class, punctual, gentle. There was no fault. He had no problems. Nothing. He was a good guy. Yes. The night before, the night before he was killed, he, I think three days, he called he will be joining us in Akosomo for the Independence Day set match. So he used to play in my band since we were playing in the same band. He, yes, the school band. We also played the Methodist Brigade Band in Akosombo. Yes, so he used to join us always, set match, everything. Every program we go, he joins us. He's a very good trumpeter. Yes, he's a very good lead trumpeter. He, he loved tr playing trumpet. He ate trumpets. He slept trumpets. Everything he did was trumpets. As Imor is laid to rest, the search is still on for the persons who murdered him in cold blood. As to whether he, Sheriff Imoro, will get justice, only time will tell. James, Kwesi Averji's report, read to you. Master, let's head to Tamale, where the embattled acting chief executive officer of the Northern Development Authority, Smaila Abdul Rahman, has resigned. So Smaila, who is facing charges of corruption and corruption-related offences, announced in a statement that the decision was taken to enable him to step aside and allow the ongoing judicial process to take place without any interference. His resignation comes few days after the commission uh, they commissioned the authorities' office facility in the northeast region. Now, our president, Eko Fuato, has appointed Sule Sambian as the acting CEO for the authority. The Rahman was appointed as chief executive officer of the authority in 2022, following the sacking of his predecessors, Dr. Al Hassan Anamzoya and Dr. Majid Haroun, who had both fallen out with the local executive of the ruling party in the northern region. He took office as the third CEO of the authority following its establishment in 2017. He, however, was accused by Dr. Adnam Zoya in June 2022, a few months after his appointment. Dr. Alas Adnam Zoya, in a petition to the presidency, accused Abdurrahman of fraudulently falsifying figures and forging his signature to cash in an amount of 10,400,000 Ghana cities. The matter was almost swept under the carpet until a private legal practitioner, Martin Pibu, petitioned the special prosecutor to investigate the matter. In January this year, the office of the special prosecutor announced it had concluded its investigation into the matter. The special prosecutor subsequently charged Mr. Smaila Abdurrahman and his two deputies and further directed their prosecution for the breaches of the procurement act. One other person identified as the CEO of the ENQ's Consortium Limited, Andrew Kundari, was also charged. On the 31st of January this year, the four persons, including the embattled CEO, appeared before a high court in Tamale, where they all pleaded not guilty to the charges and were granted a bill sum of 500,000 Ghana cities with three sureties each. On the 3rd of March, Mr. Smaila Abdurrahman issued a statement announcing his resignation as CEO of the Northern Development Authority. In a letter addressed to the Chief of Staff, Mr. Smaila said the decision was taken to enable the ongoing judicial process to take place without any interference. However, earlier on the same day prior to his resignation, he was in the northeast region to commission the new office facility for the operations of the authority. In an interview with Joy News, he had said the ongoing court process was not affecting the activities of the authority. Some of the stories we have heard is going to affect the operations of the authority. You can see that we are here with a lot of energy and, and, and doing the work that we are supposed to do. So that's what has been going on. 
and, and you can see that the RCCs and the assemblies we have visited, the municipal chief executives and their staff and the committee uh, are, are very happy with our visit, very enthusiastic, and are willing to cooperate with us in the execution of our project. So everything is fine. It's just that we will continue to do what is expected of us. Uh, is key. And you can see how people in the various communities appreciate the NDU's work. Meanwhile, President Nanado Dankwa has appointed lawyer Sule Sambian as the new acting CEO of the authority. Ilias Sutanko reporting for Joy News. Let's stay in the north this time in the upper east, um, in the upper west region because the upper west regional director of Food and Drugs Authority Kelvin Dafari has warned persons who are in the habit of selling expired and unwholesome products to unsuspecting members of the public to desist or they will be dealt with. Kelvin Dafari gave the warning after his outreach seized and burnt wholesome products worth 261,701 Ghana cities in WA. Joy News' Upper West Regional Correspondent of Fake Salam has more. According to the acting Apple's regional director of the Food and Drugs Authority, Calvin Dafari, the products which were expired, unwholesome, and bloated were picked from various supermarkets, retail centers, pharmacies, and over-the-counter shops in all 11 administrative municipal and districts in the Apple West region. They were valued at 261,701 Ghana cities and comprised of beverages, assorted food items, herbal medicines, and devices. The expired and unwholesome products were taken to the War Municipal Assembly's refuse disposal site, destroyed, and bent into houses. It was done and supervised by personnel from the Food and Drugs Authority, FDA, Pharmacy Council, and the Environmental Health Directorate. This was mainly uh, done from the 20, January 2022 to December 2022. So what you have seen here are products that were seized from shops because they are expired, they are unwholesome, some are bloated, some are, what you are seeing, went to Tumu, Hamele, Lambusie, Fancy. It's not just only coming from the one municipality. It's across the whole region. He warned the owners of the expired and unwholesome products that the FDA will come with stiffer punishment if they don't change or when you leave. For now, if we come to your shop again and pick products that are expired, that are not wholesome, we will not only seize them and leave you alone. We will have what we call administrative charge. We will give you the charge and that one will scare them at least. It will let them watch out for what they buy. So what our advice is that they should consistently check on the product they sell to ensure that if products are expired, they are dented, they are bloated, they are not good. They don't sell them. They can also even voluntarily walk to the office and tell me that, oh, we have this quantity of product that are expired. We'll come and destroy them for them and give them self disposal certificate. Instead of they living in a shop and selling them to people, or even waiting for the Food and Drugs Authority to come and see them in the shop. Kelvin Dafara, however, noted that there have been tremendous reduction of cases of expired and unwholesome products in the region as a result of the education in back on by the FDA over the years. A lot of consumers are now being aware of what they are supposed to buy. They are aware that before they buy any product, they have to check the expiry date. They have to check whether the product is bloated, whether the product is dented, whether the product is rusted. So because of our public education exercises that were carry out in markets, on radio stations, and even in schools. So I can say, even though it's worrisome, I would say the trend is reducing. Also present to witness the safe disposal of the expired products, is the Apple Senior Manager of the Pharmacy Council of Ghana, Hafiz Yaya. He spoke of the dangers involved in taking expired products. Any drug that is beyond the, ex the expiry date, the manufacturer cannot guarantee the safety and efficacy of the drug. So when, it, when you take an expired medicine, there's a potential of it not being able to solve the problem that you took it for. So if it's an infection, the, the manufacturer cannot guarantee that it will cure your sickness or it will take care of the infection. And also the manufacturer cannot guarantee that um, it will be safe for your body. So side effects come in different forms. Some are prolonged, some can be immediate. 
Report on Kojoe News. Rafik Salam. Wa. We can now go back to a shaman where 34 residents who were in custody of the military have been handed over to the Tema Police Command. Uh, we've been joined by the Member of Parliament for Shaiman, Enes Nongwe. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Honorable Nongwe. Have you been able to see these 34 uh, people and have you engaged them? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I've not been able to see them as we speak, but we are making frantic efforts to have all of them at one place so that we'll be able to talk to them. But yes, I can uh, confirm that yesterday I met with the chief of defense staff who told me they were going to release them as of yesterday. And so early this morning uh, we spoke and he confirmed to me that he has released them uh, 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 back to the uh, community. Uh, they were not released to the police command, they were just released back into the community. So I'm uh, making frantic efforts to put all of them together so that we can speak to them. But uh, before they are released, what were the um, issues or what did the uh, military tell you, reason why they kept them? Because we knew that they were 180 and then some were released and then these 34 individuals were left. Why were they being kept? Well, uh, that was what, according to them, uh, they found uh, illegal substances on some of them, uh, which they were doing further and better screening to ascertain the veracity of or otherwise of it. And so uh, 150 out of them were released because according to them, most of them were just uh, going to work and some were also uh, on bed when they picked them up. So they had to release them as quickly as possible. And the remaining 34, some of them also, according to them, uh, have some questionable uh, characters and demeanors, whatever. And so that is why they kept them to do a better and further I mean, checks on them before they release them. So, so on what basis are they releasing them now? Well, uh, which means that uh, what, what they were looking for, they couldn't find anything. Because if, if that is the case, what they told me earlier was the reason for which they were keeping them. And now they release all of them. <laughs> it means it was just baseless for keeping them there. And that is why we're saying that they are... They are right to freedom is being in free. Hmm. Uh, what has become of your um, decision to go to court to get justice for these young uh, people? It's, it's, it's still pending, it's still on the table. We are working, we are putting all the documents together and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll soon be heading to court. Either we'll go to court or we'll petition charge. I'm grateful for your time, no. but do you no. know when that will happen? Oh, very soon. Uh, the lawyers are uh, putting things together. And so I'm sure later by next week, you should be hearing from us. Today is Friday. All right. Enes Nogwe is the MP for Ashaiman, and he says that they are getting ready to go to court over uh, what they describe as injustice or brutality meted out to some 180 gentlemen in Ashaiman, and 34 of them, we are told, have just been released. And as you may have followed the news, um, some were released earlier, and then the last batch of 34 have also been released. Let's get to other stories. Some companies and the government's flagship program, 1D1F, say they may not be able to pay back the money Exim Bank gave them to put up the factories because the bank reneged on its promise to them. Government, uh, through the Exim Bank, supported some local companies with some funds to either set up factories or re-energize existing factories as part of its industrialization agenda. Beneficiaries, however, say repayment is impossible because government has starved them of funds. Here are excerpts of our hotline documentary, One District, Some Factories. If management was made aware that Exxon Bank was not going to give us the money upon completion to operate the factory, there was no way we would spend our last personal to commission the project. If you look at the activity leading towards the, the commissioning, we needed to pave the area and that cost us a lot of money. That money could have gone into sales because we don't need to pave our factory before we sell product. But we needed to complete the factory and put it in a shape that is reasonable. Everyone knows that. Ebenezer Obin Bafo is the chief executive officer of Casa Europa. 
Petersfield and Ray Limited is a manufacturing company under the One District One factory established in 2018. It was established to produce high quality natural fruit juice. Electricity came to disconnect just this afternoon. I had to go into my own resources to go and pay for them to reconnect the electricity. I don't know if now I'm in a dilemma as to fold up or not. It can happen soon, it can happen anytime from now. But it appears all is not well with the factory. Today, the processing plants have been shut. The factory is eerily quiet. Power to the plant had been disconnected on the day of my visit. Payment has been demanded long ago. It's more than two, three years now. But anytime they came, I told them there were problems that we need to solve before making profits. And that is to be difficult to pay. The shutdown of the factories has had a huge consequence on employment in the operational areas of the companies. When the factory was working, I could use my monthly earnings to support the upkeep of my family. I was even able to use my salary to support my grandchild's senior high school education. If the situation now existed before, I'm not sure I could have supported my grandchild's education. Adwa Numaba is one of the 130 people who were dismissed by Casa Drupa Company Limited. Today, she has no job. The man has never defaulted in paying our monthly salaries, but now he owes us more than three months. This is not how it used to be in the past. When the factory had not been supported by government, things were very okay. All that the man used to do for the communities here is unable to do them again. We thought government support would rather help us. Now in our Ghana Man series, for 300 years, the people of Sichuan and the Ashanti region lived in caves to escape wars. Today, the caves have been taken over by bats, but occasionally some Christians visit the caves to pray. In today's edition of Ghana Man, Kojo Yang Singh explores and from a boom loosely translated as windy caves and reports that the tourism ministry can give the place a face. <laughs> Kumewu in the Ashanti region is a forest-rich, mountainous area. This is where you will find Sechre Kwamang. You can be forgiven if this is your first time hearing of this place, but I can assure you, after today, you will never forget it. Sechre Kwamang has a captivating history. For three centuries, their ancestors lived in caves. And those caves are still there, waiting for you and I to discover them. We got very lucky at the very beginning when the Apejahine of Kwamang himself agreed to take us on a guided tour. He pulled on his Wellington boots and led us deep into the forest. So Nana, tell us about this place. Here, yeah, it's called um, Inframabum, but it's Annex, Inframabum Annex. During the olden days, you know, there were a lot of tribal wars. Yeah. And our ancestors, moved away from a certain town called Amoakun mm -hmm. yeah. and then came to settle at a place called Sumuna Kesiesu. Um, elephant hole. Oh yeah, elephant oh. hole. So uh, in the modern times we said we have modernized it to be Sumuna Kesie. Sumuna Kesie. Mm. But it's Asumuna. Right. Asunu Amuna Kesie. Right. Suddenly, the clear path we had been walking on disappeared over a steep edge. This is where most people would turn back, believing they can go no further. We certainly would have, if we didn't have Nana with us. But over four centuries ago, when Kabir, the hunter, got here, he decided to keep going. And that's how he discovered the famous Inframabum, the Windy Cave. A hunter within, that, um, within our ancestors, mm -hmm decided to go on an expedition, hunting expedition. Right. 
So fortunately, when he came down this way, he detected this cave, ah. thinking there were animals in it, mm. so that he could make a good hunt there. Mm -hmm. He entered the place and realized it was a safe place for people to live. Oh. Yeah. So he passed the night there. So the next day he came to the town mm -hmm. and got the chief informed mm -hmm. about what he had seen. Right. Then the chief decided that, ah, okay, then they should come. So when they came and inspected the place, they realized it was a nice place where people could live. Right. So they went back and then got the chief informed about what they had come to see. You know, during those times, the people were not many. Mm. So the chief decided to move, decided to move his people to, the, to, to this place to settle, right. so that enemies could not attack them. The first thing I noticed was that the caves are not exactly windy. Actually, it's boiling hot in here. I was sweating buckets. The second thing I noticed... BATS! See all the bats? Yeah. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay. So, Nana, this looks like the main chamber, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. This is um, the first hall. This is where the chief and his people used to have their meetings. Well, I've noticed some candles. Yeah, yeah. This what? is, um, it's the Christians normally. Some of the Christians come here to pray. They stay here for weeks and then do their fasting and prayers. This really is quite an adventure, but it ought to come with a warning. People with back problems will not enjoy this. I really am blown away by the idea of an entire community surviving in this cavernous subterranean space for 300 years. How did they do it? Where did they get water? Well, as it turned out, the answer was just next door. This is where they used to sit. This is the, 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 the water they used to drink. This is their yeah. wa drinking water. water yeah. So it's a stream that runs through the caves. Yes. yes. How clean is the water? Well. You know, once we see it like this, we think it's okay. So mm. we, we just take it. Wow. We need somebody. At least we need people who could come to help us so that we develop the place very well. And then make sure the history is reserved for even the younger generations to be able to tell whenever somebody comes in to have a look at the place. Mm. Yeah. It's fascinating that so much of a people's history, 300 years of their lives, could have occurred there, with most of them bent over double <laughs> for the entirety of their lives as they hid from their enemies successfully, because obviously the people survived now to create the community of Kwaman. But these caves are quite an experience. Just being in them, makes you feel like you've traveled through time to a period when technology did not exist. Everything electronic that we had felt alien in there. It's a feeling that many people would pay a fortune to experience because the world is now so completely automated. So if you want to really get back in touch with nature, I recommend these caves. It's a trip through time and that's priceless. We'll take a break on Join News Next. We'll be back with business.
Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Government has renewed its commitment to bridging the housing gap through uh, public-private pri partnerships. The Deputy Minister of Works and Housing, Abdullah Abanga, has been speaking at a Rehoboth Properties Open House event, and that's where we bring you more. According to the Deputy Minister, government is not oblivious of the importance of investing in the real estate sector as it contributes to socioeconomic development. He believes a public-private partnership will not only reduce the housing deficit, but also provide significant employment opportunities for both skilled and unskilled labor. In order to close the existing housing deficit of 1.8 million housing units and deliver efficient public infrastructure, services to the good people of Ghana, it is the policy of government to adapt a PPP, that is public private collaboration as a means of leveraging the private sector resources, experience and expertise to achieve our desired objectives. And that's why it is important for government to, to collaborate with companies like Global. And we see our relationship as very critical. For his part, Financial controller of Rehoboth Properties, William Sasu, pledged his outfit's readiness to partner government to reduce the housing deficit. These are the lowest price properties the company has ever created. We therefore urge you to climb onto the property ladder with us, Robot Heavens, today. Be your own homeowner. Be your own landlord. Be your own landlady. Invest in your future. We want to assure the ministry, and indeed the deputy minister, that Rehoboth is going to partner government to reduce the housing deficit stock that we have in this country. We've partnered Rehoboth Housing, Social Housing, to bring home ownership to um, Ghanaians. Ecoban Ghana uh, is a partner to Rehoboth Properties providing mortgages to prospective homeowners. All right, next we want to tell you about a community farming support project launched by Anglo Ashanti for its host communities. Uh, 20 communities are expected to benefit from this project by Anglo Ashanti. Here's more from Anita Sewajuka. The 500,000 CD investment will provide alternative and diversified livelihoods to enhance economic status in the Obwasi enclave. The project will facilitate the cultivation of 200 acres of maize by 100 farming households and facilitate the cultivation of 25 acres of vegetables for 50 female farmers. According to the Economic Development Superintendent of Anglo Gold, Daniel Arthur Bentum, the promotion of agriculture is a key investment area under the MINES 10-year social development plan. As part of our 10-year social economic development plan, yes, uh, the MINE had put a lot of focus on how to diversify the local economy uh, or contributing to diversifying the local economy. Together with our stakeholders in our 10 years SEDP, we put across some other interventions. Key on them was industrialization, uh, enterprise and skill development, and most importantly, uh, agric interventions. In this project, we are looking at targeting overall, as part of our SCDP, 500 uh, vegetable farmers and 500 cereal farmers, making the total about 1,000 farmers within the 10 year period. The Obwasi Municipal Director of Agriculture, Rafael Atapepra, noted the initiative by Angago Ashanti will contribute to food security in the municipality. He commended AGA for the community farming support project. Well, we are not going to get any direct benefit, but we are very happy that we have gotten a stakeholder who is going to support our farmers to um, achieve the government's aim of um, achieving food security for the nation. But um, indirectly, do we are getting some support from our, we are getting support from the government. AJ2 is going to support us to carry out our extension activities with full support uh, under the project. Amabio, a beneficiary, expressed gratitude to Anglo Gold Ashanti for the intervention. 
Angle Gold Ashanti gave me two acres of land to cultivate maize, and this has really helped me as a farmer. For Joy News, Anita Sewa Ajuga reporting. And that's business for now. More news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Property rate platform to begin operation by end of March. That's according to the GRA. That's on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. News desk returns after this break. Welcome back to Joy News Desk. We apologize for our inability to bring you tech talk uh, this morning. Uh, but before we leave you, almost 80% of Islamic marriages are null and void. This is according to head of marriages at the Registrar General's Department, Oladele Kweku Aribuke. He says that these marriages are invalid because couples failed to register their bonds legally and therefore is not acknowledged by law. He was sharing his thoughts on the Ghana Muslim marriage and divorce bill under the theme working together for a better society. Karin Obing was there and has filed this report. All legal marriages are expected to be registered under the Registrar General's Department, but over the years, most Islamic marriages and divorces have not gone through this process due to the strong tie to the Mohammedan law on marriage. To resolve this, the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Bill was put together to synchronize the Mohammedan law and the provisions of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. But almost two decades down the line, Parliament is yet to pass the bill. In a bid to push for the passage, a civic society organization, Talim Ghana, organized a dialogue under the theme Working Together for a Better Society to deliberate over ways they can contribute to the process. Speaking at the event, the head of marriages at the Registrar General's Department, Oladele Kweku Arubiki, said over 80% of Islam marriages nationwide are not registered. He says the bridegroom, the bride's wali, two witnesses to the marriage, and the Mohammedan priest, licensed under Section 21, shall assume as conveniently may be and before the expiration of one week, after the celebration of the marriage, attend at the office of the district assembly for the purpose of registering the marriage. This means the marriage should be registered within one week of the celebration of that marriage. If it is not registered within one week, that marriage is null and void. And on this, I would like to say that I can say on authority that almost 80% of Islamic marriages are not valid. Meanwhile, Member of Parliament for Asawasi, Mubarak Muntaka, underscored the need for extensive stakeholder consultation to help the process. If we want this bill to see the light of day, we need to understand that we need to form bridges. And uh, for me, the bridges that we need to form requires that we need to have a team. A team that involves members of parliament, a team that involves civil society, I'm happy to see Star Ghana here, a team that involves the Christian community. If we are able to do this, I'm sure by the time the thing will get into parliament, Madam will tell you, sometimes you get a bill that is 200 pages. And because of the heavily consultation that were done, and even amendments are uh, captured, withdrawn, recaptured, so that when it is done late, you don't have much amendment, and you can just use 200 pages, and before you realize, within a week, you are done. Speaking on behalf of the chief imam, Sheikh Arimeyao Shaibu said, the bill when passed will help resolve most divorce cases. This subject that of our discussion um, today, it's, it's a subject of great interest uh, to the national chief as a person. Why am I saying so? I serve on his advisory board, and his office is inundated day to day by mark issues. And as I wrap up the bulletin this morning, my name is Aisha Prime. Log on to myjohnline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. See you again at 12. Thank you.